I'll be reading from Matthew chapter 18, verses 1 through 6. At that time, the disciples came to Jesus, saying, Who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? And calling to him a child, he put him in the midst of them and said, Truly, I say to you, unless you turn and become like children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Whoever humbles himself like this child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. Whoever receives one such child in my name receives me. And whoever causes one of these little ones who believe in me to sin, it would be better for him to have a great millstone fastened around his neck and to be drowned in the depth of the sea. Good morning and welcome. Buenos dias y bienvenidos a Iglesia de Cristo de Web Chapel. We are, we are thrilled to have so many here today. We're glad <coughs> that we're going to hear a little bit about the missions that we are supporting, along with, with Paul Brown being here this morning. Lenny Tucker from EEM is here with us this morning as well. And uh, we're always glad to have these guys here. Uh, there are no strangers to Web Chapel. They've been here plenty of times before, and uh, we're always glad when they come to be a part of us. In a way, uh, our study of 1 Timothy is really a good study to talk about on a day where we're thinking about missions. Because in many ways, the Apostle Paul was getting Timothy ready to be a missionary of sorts. Now, we think of Timothy as a minister. In fact, we referred to him throughout this study as the young minister, Timothy. But in many ways, he was a missionary. He was going out and he was spreading God's word. He was helping to strengthen and plant churches. And so, this is a good thing to think about today. We have had an amazing week here at Webb Chapel. I I echo Brian's sentiment about the rain and the cooler weather. That's been great. Uh, Harmon has uh, hit the ground running this week. I think he and Charisma are going to be great additions to the uh, ministry staff here at Webb Chapel. We're glad that they're here working with our young people. Our text for today was actually mentioned last week when Harmon was charged with the youth ministry here at Webb Chapel. We're going to be in 1 Timothy chapter 4, verses 11 through 16. If you'd like to follow along in your paper Bible or on a device, you can be turning to that passage. The, The words of the text will also be on the screen this morning. But as we begin looking at this passage, it's probably one of the most well-known passages, definitely one of the most well-known passages from uh, the book of 1 Timothy, the letter to Timothy from Paul, where he charges him with being a minister, where he gives him some things to think about and some things to consider. Now, after this week, we only have two lessons left in 1 Timothy, and then Lord willing, we're going to move on to 2 Timothy. But in the, in the whole study of 1 and 2 Timothy, I think this may be my favorite passage. And so join me this morning as we look at 1 Timothy chapter 4, verses 11 through 16. Command and teach these things. Let no one despise you for your youth, but set the believers an example in speech, in conduct, in love, in faith, in purity. Until I come, devote yourself to the public reading of Scripture, to exhortation, to teaching. Do not neglect the gift you have, which was given you by prophecy when the council of elders laid their hands on you. Practice these things. Immerse yourself in them so that all may see your progress. Keep a close watch on yourself and on the teaching. Persist in this, for by doing so, you will save both yourself and your hearers. As we have stated already, this is a letter from an older minister to a younger minister. He is imparting knowledge to Timothy that will help him to be successful in his ministry. And right off the bat, he tells him, let no one despise you because of your youth. There are some translations that say, let no one look down upon you because of your age. And so this morning, I want us to understand something. We, we see this, this is written to a younger minister and that the older minister is encouraging him because he's young to not let someone look down on him because of his age. But I think this goes both ways. I believe that while 
Timothy was young and he was struggling because of that. I think sometimes as we get older, maybe we struggle because of that. Dennis mentioned that this morning in his prayers about the sins of his youth. He hopes he's not committing those same sins, but he also wants God to forgive the sins not of his youth as well. And so our goal for this morning is this. It is to see that your age does not exclude you from setting an example. No matter if you're young or old or somewhere in between, it do, and I leave that to you to figure out where you are, um, but it doesn't exclude you from setting an example and doing the will of God. As I've been uh, working through 1 Timothy, and it's somewhat serendipitous, we've also just hired another minister, a youth minister, a, a younger minister, I have felt very nostalgic. I have thought back to those early days when I was beginning in ministry. I thought back to uh, what it meant to uh, start doing the Lord's work and that great weight I felt on my shoulders. And there were definitely times that I thought, I'm not old enough to do this. There were definitely times when I would look in the mirror and ask myself the question, who am I to teach the Word of God to these people? And then I look at this letter and I, I see that Paul's admonition to Timothy is to command and teach these things. Now we know that he's about to share some things with them in the following part of the passage, but we also know that he's already shared some things with him. And it is Timothy's responsibility, regardless of his youth, to command and to teach these things to those whom he will be working with. And the same admonition is true for us today. While we're not all called to professional ministry, we are all called as Christians to ministry, to doing the work of the Lord. And we, like the young minister Timothy, should command and teach these things. And we, like the young minister Timothy, should not let our age be a stumbling block. Our age should not matter. Regardless of what age we are, we are still to set an example, to command and teach these things. The saying goes that age is just a number. And if we're not careful, we'll just see that as a pithy saying, something you put on a birthday card, something you put on a t-shirt. In reality, there's a lot of truth to that statement. Age is just a number. So oftentimes, we think that if you're not older, that you can't set a good example. We think if you're not an adult, that you can't do things that are worthy of imitation. When in reality, there have been plenty of adults who have committed all kinds of atrocities, sometimes in the name of God, and yet we, we fail to see that they're not setting a good example. You do not have to be an older person to set a good example. You can set a great example as a younger person as well. I'm reminded of our recent uh, camp session at Camp Awesome. We have a young man that comes to camp with us. Actually, this was his uh, second time to come to camp with us. This young man has some very uh, difficult health concerns. He requires some accommodations to be able to come to camp. One of those accommodations is that usually in the evening he has to have ice packs on his knees to help deal with the joint pain that he deals with because of uh, rheumatoid arthritis, juvenile rheumatoid arthritis. And so one night we were trying to help his mom get him situated and we noticed one of his ice packs was missing. And so we had to improvise. We had to run to the kitchen, get a, get a baggie, put some ice in it, wrap it on his leg. And I went in search of his ice pack. And I went looking around camp, thinking maybe someone had thought that would be a good way to cool off or something of that nature. And, and so I found the nurse, and the nurse didn't realize that that was that young man's ice pack. And she had borrowed it to give to a camper who had a migraine to help that camper out. So I got the ice pack, I brought it back, I explained the story to the mother and to the camper. And with no prompting at all, the camper said, if somebody has a migraine, they need this a whole lot more than I do blown away. I mean, this young man who has these terrible health concerns, I've known him since he was an infant. He and Emma actually went to preschool together. I would actually carry him into preschool some days. I've known him his whole life. And for him, who is facing so many difficulties in life, and this isn't going to go away, this is something he's going to deal with the rest of his life, for him to realize that somebody was in more need than he was. What an amazing example. What if he had said, I'm just a kid? 
What if he had said, I'm just a young person? What if he had just said, I'm, I'm hurting and I need this, and, and so what if someone else is hurting? That's not what he said. And there was no glory to be gained. He didn't say it in front of a big group of people. It was just me and his mother standing there. We were already impressed with him. But then for him to say that, it reminds me that age is just a number. We are not excluded from commanding and teaching these things. We are not excluded from giving a good example in the name of Jesus Christ because of how many years we have been here on this earth. If you are a professing Christian, you have a responsibility to live a good example regardless of your age. And we are to be the ones who set that example. Now, understandably, there's going to be times when we follow an example. We're told to follow good examples in Scripture as well. But we need to do our best to set an example for those around us. Paul is speaking to a younger minister who's going to be working in a congregation with people who are older than he is, and he tells this young minister, you, Timothy, you be the one to set the example for the rest of the believers. And we as Christians need to set examples for one another. Where one Christian is weak, some other Christian may not be weak, and they need to set that example for that weak Christian. Likewise, if you are weak in an area, it doesn't exclude you from uh, service in that area. You need to work at that. And you need to look to the examples of your brothers and sisters, and you need to live up to those examples. Those examples must be set for the believers. And I would go one step further and say those examples need to be set for the non-believers as well, the non-Christians as well. Parents, it's our responsibility to set the example for our children in our homes. Older Christians, it's our responsibility to set the example for the younger Christians in whom we, we have in our congregation. It is the responsibility of all Christians to set an example for non-believers. Not an example that says, I'm so much better than you are. Not an example that says, you're a terrible person. If you live like me, you won't be a terrible person. But an example that says, you know what, I used to struggle just like you struggle, and I can show you the way out of this. I can show you who Jesus is. That's the example we need to be setting as Christians, regardless of our age, young or old, we need to set that example. The Apostle Paul goes on to enumerate some things that Timothy needs to set the example in, and we're going to look at those a little bit more in depth. He, he goes on to tell him that he needs to set an example in speech. The Greek word there is logos. And if you know me very well, you know that logos is in John chapter 1, where, G, where we read that in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was made flesh and made his dwelling among us. That's John chapter 1, referring to Jesus. What Paul essentially is telling Timothy here is that his speech needs to be the speech of Jesus. That his words need to be the words of Jesus when he shares those with people that he meets. It, it literally means the sayings of God. And so we need to set an example in our speech and that our speech needs to be seasoned with the words of Jesus Christ. He talks about conduct. This is the way that we carry ourselves, the manner of life, our behavior. And that's not just in the assembly. That's our whole life, how we should live. He says that we need to set an example in love. And it is that agape, that unconditional love that Christ has for the church. We need to have that kind of love for our brothers and sisters in Christ. And I'm here to tell you today, you're never too young to love and you're never too old to love. We are expected to have that kind of love in our lives. In faith, that is the conviction of the truth. We shouldn't um, we shouldn't let people think that we don't know where we stand. We should be convicted in what it is that we believe, and we should set an example of that. Is that to say that we can't be wrong? Absolutely not. We can be wrong, and we need to be big, be big enough to admit when we're wrong as well. But in faith, we have the conviction of the truth, of the Word, of the Logos, the Word made flesh in Jesus Christ. And we need to do all of this in purity the way that we live our life, without defilement, without the, uh, seeking out sin. We're going to sin. We're, we're going, we can't be perfect. If we could be perfect, there would be no need for Jesus Christ. But we need to live a life that chases after Jesus, and we need to live a life that strives 
to avoid sin, that strives to uh, live a life that is in, in reflection of Jesus Christ. And that is something that we can do from a young age is all the way up till we're in, old, in the old age. We need to be willing to do these things, to set these kinds of examples. Mrs. Jacobs with you, it's never just one word. That's a quote from the movie Mr. Holland's Opus. In our, in our discipleship class, Galen has used the movie Mr. Holland's Opus quite a bit, so much so that April and I decided we would re-watch that movie and we'd watch it with Emma for the first time. If you've never seen the movie, it tells the story of the titular Mr. Holland. Mr. Holland is a musician. He goes and plays in clubs and other venues, things like that. And he needs to start making some more money, so he begins teaching, which is ironic. He teaches to get more money. Uh, but he begins teaching, and when he first starts off teaching as a band teacher, a music appreciation teacher, he's not real thrilled about it. He doesn't really enjoy his time there. And the first person that takes an interest in him is his principal. Her name is Mrs. Jacobs. And she encourages him to, st to stay the course with his students to be a compass for them. And in the line I just quoted, it's happening at graduation, and she pulls him aside, and the word that she wants to have with him is that she is retiring. And she gives him an antique compass to remind him to be a compass for those children. In a very real way, that's what the Apostle Paul is telling the young minister Timothy. He is telling him to be a compass. He is telling him to stay the course on which he was set upon. God will never force us to stay the course. It's against his nature to do so. But God wants and he delights in when we stay the course of Christianity. Of when we put on Christ in baptism for the remission of our sins to live a life that chases after Christ the rest of our lives. And that's something that we've got to start modeling for our children as they are young. The example we need to set for them, but it's an example that we must set for the rest of our lives. Regardless of our age, we must stay the course. This idea of devoting or devotion is a very interesting one. The original language bears out that the word used here actually is used to describe someone who brings a ship in after a long voyage at sea. That they have to navigate the waters around them. They have to know what's going on around them. They have to commit to bringing that ship home. And in a very real way, that's what Paul is asking Timothy to do. He is asking him to bring the ship home. He is asking him to have that kind of dedication, that kind of devotion to the public reading of Scripture, to exhortation, to teaching. And again, not all of us are called to professional public ministry, but we are all called to ministry. We are all called to the public reading of Scripture, to exhortation, to teaching. And we, like this young minister Timothy, we need to devote our lives to that. We need to be willing to bring the ship home, to be able to navigate the waters around us, to know where the hazards are, to be able to bring everyone home safely. That should be our goal as Christians, regardless of our age. We need to remember that we all have gifts. There is this dirty lie that exists in the world, and unfortunately in Christianity, that some people are born without gifts. That's not true. Every one of us are born with gifts, and every one of those gifts that come from God can be used to give glory to God. Now, the Apostle, uh, the Apostle Paul and Timothy were born with gifts that lent themselves to professional public ministry. And they made sure to use those gifts. They did not neglect those gifts. But there are all kinds of other gifts out there as well, and we should not neglect those gifts. We should find ways to use those gifts to the glory of God. We should find ways to use the things that God has blessed us with to bless others around us. And again, this does not recognize age. This is something we should do from the time we are young all the, all the way up until the time we are old. We should use those gifts. We should set that example. In the book of James, we're told that all good and perfect gifts come from above. So the gifts that we have are from God. They were given to us by God. 
And so we need to use those gifts. That's what really a lot of the letter of First Timothy, First and Second Timothy is all about. It's about Paul exhorting a young minister to use his gifts to the glory of God. Now, we read this passage here, and maybe it's a bit confusing to us because of the wording. It says, uh, these gifts which was given uh, you by prophecy when the council of elders laid their hands on you. Well, what, what gifts, what prophecy, what council of, uh, uh, council of elders is he talking about? More than likely... Uh, Paul is speaking of the local eldership in the church in Lystra, where Timothy was from, and more than likely, they did something similar to what happened here last week when Harmon started with us. They probably put their hands on him and prayed for him. They proclaimed him to be a minister of the gospel. They gave him the blessing, their blessing to go out and to do this great work. And the lesson for us is clear. We need to recognize the talents in people around us, the gifts that God has given us in the people around us. And again, not everyone is gifted towards professional public ministry. Those who are not, we need to recognize their gifts and we need to encourage them to use them to God's glory. We need to pray over them. We need to encourage them. Those who are gifted towards public ministry, professional ministry, we need to do like these elders in Lystra, and we need to proclaim this. We need to let everyone know this person's a minister of the gospel, and we need to do our best to help them move forward in that. And that's something that can start when you're little, and you can do it for your entire life, this encouraging, this building up of others. I did a a wedding this summer uh, down in the Houston area, and in attendance at this wedding was a young man who's in high school now, but I first knew him when he was a little guy. He used to come to our uh, church camp. And after the wedding at the reception, he sat down and he started talking to me. We hadn't seen each other in years. And he started talking to me, telling me about his life. He started asking me questions about my life. And he said, Mr. Paul, I've never heard you teach a bad lesson. And I thought, oh, buddy, you haven't heard me teach a whole lot. But that was so encouraging to me. And you know what? What if he had thought, well, I'm just a kid. I can't say things like that. We would have missed out on that opportunity. We need to remember that regardless of age, we have the opportunity and we have the responsibility to remember where our gifts come from and to be a blessing and share those gifts with others and to encourage others to use their gifts to the glory of God. Up until now in this message, we've gotten a lot of the why. We've gotten a lot of the the purpose, a lot of things that, that Paul expects Timothy to do. Now he's going to give him some practical application. I like to call it the how. He's going to give him the how on how to do these things, and we can learn a great deal from this as well. He begins by telling him to practice these things. The old saying goes, practice makes perfect. We need to practice our gifts. We need to find places to practice those gifts. If your gifts do lend themselves to public professional ministry, you need to find a place to practice those gifts. Today, our Brookdale team meets. That's a great place to practice your gifts if you are uh, gifted towards public ministry. But what if your gift is not towards public ministry? Because there's all kinds of other gifts. There's gifts of teaching, there's gifts of exhortation, there's gifts of giving, all kinds of other gifts. And there are places that we can practice those gifts. We need to find those places. As older Christians that recognize these gifts in younger Christians, we need to create places where people can practice these gifts. The Apostle Paul goes as far here to say, immerse yourself in these things. I like that language. I like that idea of being immersed, of being covered up in whatever it is that we are doing so that we can bring glory to God. And that does not recognize age. Regardless of age, We need to practice the gifts that God has blessed us with. But along with that, along with practicing our gifts, along with developing those gifts, we need to keep a watch on ourselves and our teaching. Because you see, there is a temptation to become very impressed with ourselves. There is a temptation to think we are the only ones that have these gifts. There is a temptation to think that we know better maybe even the what is written in Scripture. And so there is personal responsibility to watch over ourselves. 
But I would take it another step and say that we have a congregational responsibility, a brotherhood responsibility, that if we see one of our brothers or sisters becoming uh, conceited because of their gifts, if we see them practicing these things to bring glory to themselves and not to God, we need to, in love, go to that person and share with them what we see. We need to help bring them back to center. We need to help them to stay the course. And there is nothing that is more sobering than the honesty of a child. And so as adults, listen to these younger ones in the congregation. Listen to these children, because they'll tell you what's on their mind. They'll tell you what they think about you. And if you're getting the big head, they're going to let you know, and it's going to bring you down a little bit. To the more seasoned Christians in the audience, I believe it's our responsibility to share with the younger ones when they maybe are getting a little too big for the britches. And we do it lovingly, and we do it in a way that Jesus would do it, but we still do it. Regardless of age, we must watch over ourselves and our teaching. And Paul ends by saying to persist in these things. For by doing so, you will uh, save both yourself and your hearers. It's not enough just to put on Christ in baptism and then to go on living a life that doesn't glorify Christ. Yes, we do need to put on Christ in baptism. Yes, we do need to come in contact with the blood of Jesus Christ for the remission of our sins. But the grace, and the, the grace that, that saves us from our sins is a continual process. The reconciliation of sin is a continual process. It's a daily renewal. God has committed to that. God has committed to being with you always. And if we're going to live a life that is an example set, that lived in the example set by Jesus Christ, we need to realize that our service to God is not a one-time thing. That the recognition of our talents of God is not a one-time thing. That coming together and doing the right thing is not a one-time thing. That we must persist in these things. Practice makes perfect. The more we immerse ourselves in these godly gifts, the more we practice them, the better we're going to get at them, and the better we're going to be able to share them with others, and ultimately that will help bring the lost to Jesus Christ. But it can't just be a one-time thing. That goes against the nature of God who is committed to never leaving and forsaking us, and we need to commit to never leaving nor forsaking God as well. I hope today that you never say the words, I'm too young, or I'm too old. There are things that are age appropriate. Toddlers shouldn't play with chainsaws. Senior citizens shouldn't be in, in the play area at Chick-fil-A. Those are age appropriate things. But we also need to realize there are some things that don't recognize age. Setting a good example for God the Father, Jesus the Son, the Holy Spirit, does not recognize age. We need to do this from the time we are little until the time we draw our last breath. The greatest example we have in Scripture is Jesus, who was sinless, who did not need remission of sins, going to his cousin, John the Baptist, to be baptized, to set an example for the believers. This morning, if you have not yet put on Christ in baptism, if you've not had your sins washed away, if you haven't expressed your love for Jesus in that way, we want to encourage you to do that this morning. If you're not sure about that decision, but you want to talk about it some more, we'd love to sit down and study the Word of God with you today. Today, if you are here and you're struggling to set an example, if you're struggling with your age today, I'm too young or I'm too old or I'm just not good enough, we want to pray for you today. We see it as an honor to be able to do so. If you're joining us online, there's some points of contact on your screen. You can use one of those to reach out to us. We'll do our best to meet whatever need it is that you have. If you're here in person today, if you need to respond to the Lord's invitation, we would ask that you do so as we stand and as we sing.